Okay. 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 Now, I think now we have a signal. Um, well, yes, I hope so. Well, let me give another check here. I did some, I did some rehearsals before, but uh, well, this had to happen. Well, hopefully this will be all right now. Um, good. Okay, now let's start again. So hopefully this will work. Um, I've prepared this for quite a while, but uh, unfortunately the microphone didn't work. Doesn't matter. I will start right over again. So this is the show Shaping Openness, the show on code architecture and tools and research and education. And I want to do this show uh, on a regular basis because I think um, I learned a lot in the last few months and years about collaboration and about working together um, on the web and in the center of in the center of all this learning there are digital tools there's a lot of open source code and uh, most of all it is um, a decentralized architecture that uh, I use because uh, everybody I work with is somehow in a remotely uh, is remotely placed. Um, so uh, and in this current crisis where everybody switches to online learning and working, uh, I thought it, it it might be good to um, release the first episodes on my favorite tool uh, on GitLab. And this is uh, what I want to do together with you. I don't want to hold any lectures here, but uh, I would really appreciate uh, to work together with you and um, experiment with working together in this uh, way of uh, you are in front of your screen and me in front of mine. And we do not know each other, but let's check out how far we get with collaboration in real time. So I will do something that I, well, roughly, I haven't prepared it, but I know it very, very well. Um, and I'd like to get you involved in it because um, I think it is, uh, it is there's uh, some fun in learning when it's not just a lecture, but it is something that is, uh, um, it's based on many perspectives and many perspectives and many opinions. Um, and if you give your experience and your knowledge about working with uh, online tools to produce source code, to produce uh, open educational resources, I will have the chance to learn from you. And this is what I really want from this show. So um, I want to share my passion with you about GitLab. I have to say that I'm absolutely not uh, related to the company GitLab. And so let me switch over to the browser and get started right away with um, with this tool GitLab. So um, GitLab, as you can see on the website, is a tool that is um, driven by a company and you can use it for free and you can pay money for them uh, to use some more features. And uh, the thing is that uh, this is somehow called an open core model. So they make the money with uh, enterprise features, which is good because uh, I'm very happy that they have this model because uh, I can rely on um, the code base that I use uh, by GitLab because they, um, they seem to be financed very well and um, people get paid for their work. But uh, the coolest thing is that they offer a community edition of GitLab that everybody can install uh, him or herself in order to have uh, 
a code hub of their own. So um, if you don't want to host your code on the company's website, gitlab.com, which is fine, which will I, which, uh, will I also do, um, which I will also do uh, tonight, um, then you can install your um, GitLab instance of your own. So um, I promised not to talk so much, but get into it. And uh, so I want to show you how to register and hopefully you're going to join me on this uh, little show on uh, registering at GitLab and getting started. And on the way, I'm going to tell you why GitLab is cool, but let's, let's get into it. Otherwise, you just watch and, uh, well, I want you to get involved. So from this website uh, that you hit with uh, GitLab.com, um, you will come to sign in or register. So if you register, no prop. Um, you can type in the credentials, whatever, and you have to say that you're not a robot, and then you say register. Then you get a mail, and you have to confirm the usual stuff. So, but I also I prepared this, um, so I, I'm going to sign in with an account that I have already set up before. Um, so let me use this one here. All right. So, after a f after you register uh, uh, registered a fresh account here, uh, you hit this landing page where you see there's nothing. So, and uh, what we're gonna do is uh, first of all go through the settings because um, the settings in GitLab they are quite um, they are quite. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do. You can do a lot with the settings. And my experience from my from my courses that I give on GitLab, not on the web, but in, in presence with people, is uh, that it is useful to explain some of the things in uh, in the forefront. So um, let's go and have a look at here. So I'm Paula Peterson uh, in this episode, and my uh, nickname is Paul Peter. So um, and if you already on GitLab, go with me to this um, settings menu here and have a look on the sidebar. There's lots of options that you can choose from, but I want to start again, uh, start right uh, from the profile page. So we can upload an avatar here and uh, you can fill in your name, you can fill in your mail address and you can fill in the commit mail. This is usually the mail that you um, put in uh, after registering and you can fill in something something else here. So, but first of all, I want to have some avatar here because I, I'm Paula Peterson and I want to, yeah, I want to have an avatar. So uh, let's have a look at uh, avatar generator. So I'd be happy if someone posted uh, avatar generator. Um, so, I'll, uh, well, let's take this one here. Okay, so, oh, is this Paula Peterson? Well, let's see, what can I do? Long straight, has straight. Oh, so, okay. Uh, no, 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 no. So, what is long hair, Frida? Oh, this is good. This is good. Okay, so, um, yeah, I can spend some time here. But, uh, well, I leave it as it is. And I download the PNG file. So I save it and I go back and choose file and choose this from my download folder. Well, that is, and I want to, uh, I want to cut this. Well, this looks good. Set new profile picture. Well, that's Paula Peterson, right? And everything else I leave like that. So that's it. I update the profile settings. Cool. So and I want to reload the page because I want to see Paula Peterson on the left hand side. Well, there she is. Great. Now I want to show you something that is important here, uh, especially when you are working with uh, students. And uh, when you're working with students and people who perhaps don't want to be benchmarked by artificial intelligences or who want to who want not to be 
um, seen by their teachers. Uh, there's one setting that is quite important down here. You can set this as a private profile. And um, I want to show you the difference so that you can see what uh, this is all about. Um, so let me just open a new tab to show you the profile page when I'm logged in. So let's see the difference here. I open a new tab and I go to this tab. So this is what one can see when you are logged in. So visitors of your page, they won't see anything of uh, the private activities that you have. So we have none private activities here, but as you can imagine, perhaps you know this from GitHub, there are some squares that uh, show your activity per day. And uh, we haven't done anything yet because it's a fresh account, but um, you could be judged or students could be judged by the activity here. And I read stories uh, or about um, uh, profilers who go to GitHub and see when someone uh, sends an application for a job, they have a look at the uh, activity rate on GitHub to see uh, if this is a high performer in the open source context or if it is somebody who's just uh, yeah, sometimes posting an issue or something that, like that. So, And if you get people out of this benchmarking by uh, other people or by artificial intelligences, um, there's one option that you can hit here and say it is a private profile. And if we do this, if we say it's a private profile and we... we uh, Go here again. It doesn't change because it says uh, we are locked in. But I copy this and switch to a private browser window. And I paste this here. And this is all what it says. So I think this is important. You should show this to everybody who's using GitLab because uh, um, it's I think it's necessary to let people know what kind of tool they are using and what kind of information they are exposing to the public. So I go back to the other browser and uh, go back into the first sub tab and uh, show you again where I did this. It's down on the page, it's private profile. So um, this is the first thing on profile. Well, if you go to account on the left hand side, we, t we see another thing that is quite important, I think. It is the two-factor authentication. Um, I haven't activated it because I don't want to make it so complicated, but for my real account at work, of course, I have enabled two-factor authentication because um, if somebody steals away your credentials or uh, comes with a brute force attack on your account, you will lose your identity in GitLab, and this is bad. So... Um, it's very important that you enable two-factor authentication, although I know that it is, uh, well, it gets on your nerves, but it's necessary. So um, the other thing is, the other thing is you can change your username. So, and uh, one uh, thing that this might be important is, um, perhaps you think you want to be some somebody else, but uh, at work, we have made the experience that if people um, log in by LDAP, and get some kind of um, uh, machine-made credential username like uh, PIT3102. Uh, in, in social contexts on the web, in GitLab, nobody will know who that is. So although GitLab shows the, the, the normal name, um, but it's better perhaps to have your usual username, the one that you want. So if you log into your GitLab instance, via LDAP, you should immediately after the first login change your username to what you want it to be. If you do it later, there might be some misunderstandings, who is this and who is that, and I cannot guarantee that all your repository and your identity will stay the same. I guess so, but I never tested this because um, I, I didn't want to risk it. So um, I'm fine with this username. And it's important that you can delete your account here. This is uh, necessary for everybody who wants to leave. For example, students who want to quit university and they don't want to leave anything here so they can de delete the account. Well, everything else that is here is not so important right now, except for perhaps the page notifications. Um, when, you, when you come on, uh, when you go on uh, working with GitLab, you will recognize that it sends you mails, which is good because you get informed usually about everything that's going on. 
but um, it is uh, it is necessary that you know how or where you could uh, decrease the level of uh, verbosity of GitLab because it wants to tell you everything about uh, what you have granted access to and uh, what failed or whatever. Um, and this is the this is the place where you can tinker with the notification level. Well, this is quite important. Thing that I will uh, um, speak about in the next episode uh, is GPG keys. Uh, ex excuse me, SSH keys. SSH keys is uh, because if you want to use GitLab from your computer in a setting where you push and pull, as it is. Uh, uh, usual for using Git and GitLab, you need to um, deploy an SSH key here. I'm going to show this later. So, and the uh, uh, last thing that I want to show is the preferences page, which is nice to see because you can change somehow the color. Well, I'm fine with the color here. And uh, you can change the syntax highlighting theme, for example, if you want, uh, if, if you want it to be the same as your editor. And another thing that I usually do is I change the default dashboard to start projects. That means that I have somehow my favorite projects on the first page, which means that I give them a star myself. So I like my own projects with a star. And uh, this causes my start, uh, my landing page, my start page in GitLab to be filled only with the projects that I'm currently working on. So I throw away the stars from the projects later on uh, when I don't work on them anymore. And uh, well, if I'm good, I just have the five most important, um, the five most important uh, projects on my start page. So this is what I usually do here. You can do lots of other stuff. Um, my recommendation is even if you come from, a, from another language or another country, leave it uh, in English, because all the documentation, all the talk on Stack Overflow is in English, and it's about English terms on the left, English terms in GitLab. So even if you're German or Spain, uh, Spanish, uh, leave it uh, leave it in English. So I save the changes, and I'm through with this one here. So uh, I return to the dashboard page, which means I click on this logo here and I come to the dashboard. And as you see, uh, the tab Start Projects is highlighted. I don't have a single project, so nothing is here to see, but uh, this is what I just recently configured. Well, um, so if you're with me, um, let's start over with a new project, which means um, you can have a new project here. Um, I don't know how many you can have because it's gitlab.com. They offer a free, uh, a free, f uh, f um, a free way of using GitLab. You just have to pay if you want some more resources or you want more projects or you want special features for enterprise usage. Um, you can do really cool stuff for free here. And uh, when you uh, install your uh, uh, a GitLab instance of your own, um, you can do even more with it. So. I always show the community version, the basic version. I, I'm not going to show anything special because I um, I use the community edition because I want for, I wanted uh, that everybody is uh, able to uh, do the same as I do. I want uh, GitLab not to cost anything for people working in research and education uh, because I always think of my students and I don't I don't want them to pay money for for using the tools that I want them to use. So um, this is the free version. And now I'd like to start over and create a new project and explain something on, um, on uh, building a new project and what it is all about to have a project. So let me first explain. GitLab, is, uh, as GitHub also is, a place where you can host your code. And second, you can collaborate on that code with other people. So in the next episode, uh, in an upcoming episode, I don't know if in the next one, depends on if you join me, so I can invite you and we can do this together. In an upcoming episode, um, I, uh, I want to show how you uh, invite and collaborate on projects. Today, I'm, I think I'm going to do it on my own and perhaps you join me in the next episode. So in hosting code, on GitLab means that it can be source code, like uh, uh, people uh, who are programming, uh, and they, they put in uh, Python code or PHP code or HTML or CSS or whatever they put uh, on GitLab. 
Um, or, and this is my, my favorite use case in most of my projects, is I put text files in there to build, for example, open educational resources or build um, scientific articles or to build uh, books. And all this um, seldom has to do with code. So if you up to here thought that GitLab is just a tool for programmers and it's just a tool for writing code, writing Python code or whatever, it's not. It's great for that use case. It was built for writing code and hosting code and collaborating on code, but I mostly I use it for writing text collaboratively in the same way as people use Git and GitLab to write software. So, and this is uh, what I'm, I want to show you here because um, I have a lot of experience with people uh, who I involve in GitLab projects that are not programmers and it works quite well. Um, because uh, the, I, I, I do not start from the command line. I do not start with Git on their computers. I always start in the browser. So this is why I invite you again to join me here, to go with me through these episodes, because we, uh, we can, uh, together we can explore what collaboration in GitLab means. So, um, so this is going to be a text project. I'm going to show you with some text files what you can do to host source code or to host sources on GitLab and collaborate on them. Now, let's have a new project here. So I click on new project and then I'm asked to uh, enter a name. I show you, just want to show you this here. You can also import projects from somewhere else, for example, from GitHub if you want to, and you could create from template and um, you can do other stuff here, which is just, I've just pointed that for those who are perhaps are uh, new, not new, new to this, but for the beginners, uh, for those who, uh, who are just uh, starting right over, I'm going to put here um, a project name and the project might be um, a report. So it's going to be some kind of a report. It's, uh, I put a description here, which is, uh, nothing more to explain about, but uh, it might become important here because uh, two things are important here. You can have a project name that is read by people. So I write a capital R for report, but the project slug might be filled with words that are search engine relevant. So if you want to publish your project, you should think about if the project slug might contain or should contain some special words that should be found by Google and their friends. So I leave it at report, but keep this in mind. The project description is um, a report on animals in the neighborhood. How do you spell that? Is that right? No. And it needs to be an H. So is that right? No, it's not. So what does it say? Aha, uh -huh. good. Um, a report on animals in the neighborhood. So what is important here is, for example, that you can put markdown in this field. This means that you should do a good description, but I advise you to put a link here uh, to wherever you want to point to. Um, so let's uh, point to, uh, for example, Mozilla. So, and uh, you can paste the URL here, but you can also uh, use Markdown language here, which is uh, something that I want to spend another episode on. If you're not familiar with Markdown, it's quite easy to learn and very powerful. But if we wanted to uh, put a text here that is not so, uh, techy like with a URL, we can write, please uh, have a look at the, and now it comes, project page. Well, that's it. For more information. Now, and I open this up here. Uh, I zoom into because I want you to see this. Uh, so a markdown link is always 
these kinds of brackets here and these, excuse me, till here. And this gives us a link. So this is what people are reading and this is what the machine links to. So um, make it small again. This is just a short example for the ability to put Markdown in very many places in GitLab. And uh, you will see Markdown is quite important and it's worth learning it. And it's very valuable because uh, it is a markup language that you can use everywhere on the web right now. It's everywhere. So um, I want to make this a public project because I want you to see my project and I want you to join me and request access and everything that is uh, that makes collaboration possible with uh, you and me. So um, you can, you should, you should initialize the repository with a readme file because if there exists one file at least, more functions are available in the user interface. If you do not initialize the repository with the readme, uh, there's a lack of important functions. And uh, if you forgot, no problem, you will find out how to add a readme file afterwards. But if you do not have any other reason, um, just put, uh, just put a um, readme file here. So that's it. So uh, let's have a last look. Well, this looks good. And I create the project now. Very good. Okay, so now there comes a warning. Um, this It's this warning here. It has to do with what I told you about the settings in your profile. Um, it says you won't be able to pull or push project code via SSH until you add an SSH key to your profile. Just for a short explanation, we don't need this now. Uh, just for a short explanation. Um, th the professional way of working with GitLab is that you use uh, a, um, an editor on your own computer and then you transfer the code to GitLab and from GitLab by actions that are called push and pull. So pushing from your client computer to GitLab is push and getting changes that other people made on GitLab is pulling the code. So and um, in order to do this in a secure way, encrypted, you need an SSH key and you have to generate this key and put certain files in certain places. And this will allow you to push and pull and clone and all the fancy stuff that's coming up uh, in a secure way. But we do not need this now. So I click on don't show this again because I know where to find it afterwards. I showed you before it's in the settings and on the left hand side at SSH keys. So we don't lose anything if we click don't show again. So it goes away. That's it. I get rid of this one. And now we're going to have a look at the, I call them landing page of your project. Now let's say um, we created a project, which is a bunch of functionality and uh, um, things that, that you can do with your source code. I'll explain further later on. But first of all, the project is some kind of bundle of functionalities. Within the project, there's something that you might have heard. It's uh, the, the repository. The repository is the place where you have your code, where you have your source code. And on the landing page of your project, you can see the source code in this, well, it's not a tree, it be, it's gonna become a tree here. Um, in this tree of files and folders. So what we, what we see here is we see, we have an insight in the files or the file within this project's repository. So as you can see on the left-hand side, there's also in the sidebar a menu item that's called repository. If I click on that one, see the same, but I see also all the functions that have to do with the files and the repository itself. So we see again, it's one file, it's the initialized, it's the file that we initialized the repository with when we created the project. So I always go back to the landing page to start 
right again so that we don't lose our, our path here. So I go again to the landing page of the report. And we see some offer here from GitLab to use Auto DevOps, which is a nice function that we don't re need right now. So I click here to get rid of it. And as you can see, the result of using Markdown in the description is this here. We have the project page linked with the URL that we put there. And it looks like that because we used Markdown with the two kinds of brackets and parentheses. All right, so let's have a look at some other elements here. Um, it is uh, important to see is that here is the sign for that it is a public repository. So everybody can see this repository on the web from now on. This is what I wanted, but I just tell you. So if somebody is not logged in and hits this URL, as I will do now in the other browser, this is a private browser that uh, I used before. I'm not logged in here. And if I go to this website, Nothing happens. What's up? Well, what's up? Nothing's up. Don't know what's going on. Let me see, is this working? No, it seems to be a GitLab problem because it can load other are the browser tabs. Well, that's a pity. Are they down or what is it? Nope, there they are. So I go back. This is the private window. Okay, yeah, this is what I want to show you. Um, I'm not signed in. I'm not registered at all. And this is the public view of my new project, which is good. And well, this is a great number. These are all the projects, uh, 17 million and something. Well, it's the projects on GitLab.com. So seems to be a hit place. Very nice. I go back to Firefox in the, in the other one. So here's where I'm logged in and I'm going to close all these. Now, um, you see, it's a public repository, a public project. Everybody can see it. Um, the next things that I want to show you is that we can get rid of some of these functions here. Uh, they are all very cool and very important, but if you want to collaborate with people who are not used to GitLab and you want to make them like GitLab, you want them to work with you in GitLab, you should do something about making it easy and comfortable for them. This is my experience. So uh, instead of showing off and saying, well, this is CI, CD, and this is operations, and this is security compliance, you should just get rid of all the menu items that you don't need for the project that you want to do with your students and your colleagues. And I want to show you how to do this. So if, you, if you're with me, I don't know if you're with me, but uh, if you watch this later, you can just follow along. So um, on the bottom of the sidebar, you can go to settings and uh, there are lots of possibilities for settings, but we go to general. We start with the general settings. And if we go to the general settings, well, GitLab is slow. Well, um, I tell you what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna switch off in the uh, general settings, all the menu items on the left hand side. So I'm going to use the time just to explain some things. What we need, of course, is the repository. So we, 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 we leave the repository. We want the repository. Um, we need the issues because they are cool. They, they are very useful for a certain workflow. We want the merge request because that's the the special feature for quality control and collaboration here. We want merge requests. And um, we want CI, CD, which is continuous integration, continuous deployment, but we don't want to have it uh, right now, I think. And we're going to leave all this out here and uh, 
use the wiki and we get rid of the snippets. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, well, this was the, uh, the word and now it's switched. So this is, uh, this is the general settings page. So you can put a project avatar here, which I don't do now. You can do this with your own project. But the, um, the logic of these menus is everything is collapsed and you have to expand it here with these buttons. So I expand the visibility project features and permissions tab. Here you can change from public to private. Um, I leave it with public. And this is for you. I allow users to request access. We're going to see what that means. Um, you might be able, if you log in and look for this project, to request access. So that means if you think somebody made something interesting and you want to join, you can ask for access and they will write you something or give access and say, um, yeah, you can work with us. This is the work that you can do. So I leave this checkbox ahead. Now I said, we want the is issues, we want the repository, we want the merge request, we don't want forks right now, we don't want pipelines, we don't want the container registry, we won't, don't like uh, want to get large file storage, we don't want packages, we want the wiki, we want, don't want snippets, and we don't want pages. And uh, we save the changes. And... Uh, Well, should change. Let's see here what's going on here. Oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well. Hmm. Well, of course, this happens when I do this episode. Well, um, no, no. Let's see what it what it takes. Perhaps they are tinkering around with the server. Happens. Um, it's uh, narrow on the server side. 502. So I refresh the page. <laughs> nope. Aha. Uh -huh. Good. No, see, it's still the same. This is what happens when you do it live. No problem for me. Um, so I go on the general settings tab again. I do the same as I did before. Hopefully now I can save my settings. So again, issues, repository, merge requests. No forks, no pipelines, no container registry, no large file storage, no packages. But we want a wiki. We don't want snippets and we don't want pages. Now I save the changes. Ooh, I see this. Great. So I go back to the landing page of my project and this looks much better now. Um, well, this is cool. Um, for somebody who um, is new to GitLab, this is much more comfortable because uh, they don't get distracted by all the fancy names on the sidebar and they sound very technical. So, um, Let's write some code or let's see what's possible uh, to edit what's in here. So there are, I want to show you some uh, functions that, uh, that uh, are basic for using GitLab uh, in the browser. Um, in an upcoming episode, I will show how you can do this in a more convenient, but more uh, professional and thus more a uh, complex way, but very cool. Stay cool. Uh, I'm going to show this later on. So first of all, I'd like to edit the readme MD. So there's just one file. Let's work with this file. And uh, let's see what happens if I click on this file. So GitHub is all about, GitLab, excuse me, GitLab is all about sharing source code online and collaborate on that. And I told you we're not going to program anything here. We just work with text. So there is text in the README MD, not much, but there is. So um, I click on this one and I come to the details page. Well, if you have ever used WordPress or something like uh, a block, whether it is in the back end or in the front end, there's always a list page and there's always a details page. 
So if you see the list of block entries on the front end, so on the website, you click on the headline of one block, block entry, and you come to the details page and can read the article. Same for the back end. If you are the author and you have the list in the back end of all the articles that you or somebody else wrote, you can click on a certain article and edit this single article on a details page. Same thing here, a list of files and you can edit every single file in the browser by clicking on its name. So um, this is the view of how the text looks like uh, in the browser. And now I want to edit this text. So I click here on edit and I come to just a form field as it is quite, it's widespread. It's in every content management system like WordPress or Typo3 or Joomla or whatever you use, Kantao. There is a backend with form fields where you put your content in. Think the same for GitLab. Nothing complicated right now. It's just an editor field and you put your text in it. Um, as you can see, this is uh, just a copy of the description. This has, GitLab has done this for us so that there is some sensible content here. But we can add something. Um, this is a report on animals in the neighborhood. Have a look at the project page for more information. Um, we are going to deal with dogs, cats, and frogs in the neighborhood. So as you see the um, page scrolls to the right hand side, you can avoid this with a uh, soft wrap. And uh, well, this is all for now. I added some text and now as I usually do, I want to see how, how is it going to look like. So I have a preview tab here. And if I click it, I can see what this will look like when I save it. Well, it's just a sentence edits, edit, uh, nothing special. This is, as I said before, Markdown. So uh, who, uh, whoever knows Markdown, I don't, don't have to talk such a lot about it. I will do this in another episode. So um, just uh, to mention the um, file extension, MD is for Markdown. So GitLab knows that it has to, or that it should make this colored because it syntax highlights this text as it is a Markdown file. So this is nice because it structures our text. I will add something here. So let's uh, put some uh, another headlines here. So we're going to talk about dogs. We're going to talk about cats. And we're going to talk about frogs. So and I need some uh, blind text. There's a nice generator that I use. Um, I take this here. And I put it here, I put it here, and I put it here. Well, looking at the preview, see, this is a headline of uh, the highest niveau, and this is second, which you can see I used one hash for the first and two for the second level. And uh, let's say we need some other stuff here. Uh, let's say. Let's have, um, uh, where are they? Where are the dogs? In the backyard, in the street, in the house. Well, and you can see the syntax highlighting here. This is how you, um, how you uh, put uh, an unnumbered list. And uh, this is what it looks like. So this is enough text. I wanted to, this is, might look somehow boring, but I wanted to have it look simple and boring because GitLab always has the numbers of being a professional tool for software production. But the intention of my uh, show here is to work with you together in GitLab to show that it has a very flat learning curve if you just start slowly and not so complicated complicated. So I start with the basics. And if you follow along, you will be able to do very complicated stuff afterwards. And um, well, I can promise this.
because uh, some years of experience with various colleagues from various backgrounds showed me that everybody got on board in a way and uh, they themselves said, well, I want to do something more now. I want to learn this and that. But all the time they were, they were involved in the project and they did something in the project that was very important. And it was not always the complicated, but the important stuff. And this is what you want in a team. You don't want just the nerds in your team because uh, they are in the team because they know how the tool works. You want all the domain experts in your team and you want them in your team because they know their domain and you don't have them in your team because they know the tool. But the tool shouldn't be uh, a barrier. They sh the tool shouldn't hinder them from doing their work. So this is very important for me and this is why I want to do this show because I always want to show that it is, uh, well, it needs some learning, but it can be simple to get on board. This is why I extend a little bit on writing this simple file here. Now, um, in WordPress usually, you say save or you click the, the save button. And um, now the button has a different name. It's called commit changes. This is uh, the label that uh, points to basic principle of Git. Not just GitLab, but Git. Git is the software behind that. No excourse here. Just take it at the moment. Git is the software behind that. Git was first, then came GitLab, and uh, before came GitHub. But Git is in the background. Git makes it possible to track your changes here. And uh, the change that we make here is called a commit. So we add something to the project and in order to do that, we save it, but it's called commit here. There's some kind of more complicated logic behind that, but take commit as safe right now. So I commit the changes and um, in a good old manner from the old internet times where the um, the connection could be lost. I learned some lessons from the 502. I mark everything and copy it in the uh, clipboard, uh, not to lose my work when I click commit changes and I get an error again. So this is from the old times. I commit changes. No, oh, I'm lucky. All right, so this is the updated file now. And uh, nothing special about that we just saved the text here but the thing is that git and gitlab and this is also true for github they track everything you do which is a feature it's not it's not a surveillance feature that uh, the others use and you suffer from but it's a feature that is basic or this is essential for the software it's essential for the software because um, it's important to know who added what, when, and why. And this makes especially Git and GitLab uh, a huge thing for open science. Because if we're talking about reproducibility, accountability, and um, transparency as core values of open science, knowing who did what, when, and why is an important feature. So uh, let's have a look at the commits, which is uh, the points in time when somebody saved something. And I just saved something. I committed my changes. So I click on commits. And you can see here, this was the initial commit 22 minutes ago when we just created the project. Now, one minute ago, I updated the README. And this is the version history, as we can call it. It's the version history. You can read it from the top to the bottom, and it shows everything that is that has happened by various persons. It's just me here, so it's just Paul Peterson here, but um, it's various, it can be various persons contributing to this project, participating, collaborating. So, and um, I want to say this because you don't, uh, you can think about this. Is this good or is this bad? If everybody knows what I'm contributing, but those, uh, the people who are working 
who work with GitLab and uh, the like, they of course know this and they see it as a very good feature because it makes work transparent and uh, it gives uh, occasions to communicate about. So there's, uh, there's uh, everything is, is fine with that. Um, all right, so what did we do? Let me go back. Um, we came from the landing page and we edited a single file. And the idea is, this is how I frame GitLab usually. It's a universal content management system. It's a content management system for uh, open education resources, for research data, for research reports, for websites, and of course for the usual software that needs to be compiled and apps built for your mobile phones and whatever. So it is, well, simply speaking, GitLab doesn't care what you store in it. Um, you can even store Word files and Excel sheets in GitLab. It doesn't care. Um, so think of it as a content, manage, man, content management system that you can use for various purposes. And this is quite cool because you and your colleagues just need to learn not one tool, you need other tools too, but don't get me wrong. You, if you learn GitLab and you learn to think in this collaborative way that GitLab needs to think, um, you get power to work together with other people on various artifacts, building software, building books, building articles, building OER, whatever. So I want to say it's worth learning all this stuff. And this is why I do this show, because I want to show this. And I'd be very happy if you join me. And in the next episodes, we're going to collaborate on this. Well, um, let me let me do uh, a last thing here. And then I think uh, we're going to finish this one. Um, you can see uh, here um, at the activity tab, this is one I want to show you, you can see what, what happens here. So if you're collaborating with other people together, you can see various events. And uh, for, for a certain reason, I want you to point, uh, I want you to, uh, to be pointed to this, um, to this term event, because it becomes important later on in upcoming episodes where we make GitLab listen for these events and do something with our commits. So the upcoming episodes will show a workflow that uh, means that whenever, when, uh, whenever somebody contributes something and somebody commits something in GitLab, GitLab builds something out of their contribution and out of the project which is cool because uh, every, contribu every contribution by everybody joining the project um, will lead to building a new version of the whole thing everybody's working on. And um, this is just uh, to finish this up. You can see who did what on the commits tab, as I showed you, and on push events, who pushed something. So pushing means somebody contributed something. I did. I updated the README. There was no merge. We, we haven't talked about merges right now. We haven't any issues right now. Nobody commented and the team tab is empty. So the only thing that we did is we contributed and we can say this was some kind of a push. We committed something and this was pushed to the project. Well, um, this is from my side, this is all for now. Um, I'm going to stop here for this first episode and um, just give you some short insight on the plan for next time. Next time I want to show you uh, to get how you get the people on board who are working with Microsoft Office and who never wanted to program anything, who perhaps 
are not familiar with writing HTML pages, for those people who don't use Markdown in their everyday life, but you want them on board because you want to have a team with all the domain experts that you need. So you need people in your team that perhaps you tell how to how the, all this stuff works, or you just let them on board and feel safe and at home because they upload and download the usual files that you, they that they use. So this might might be Word files, Excel files, and other files, for example, PowerPoint or graphics or InDesign files or whatever. And I want to show you that this works quite well. This works quite well. It's it's not GitLab is not intended to deal with these kinds of files, but it works very very well. And what you get for that if you um, use GitLab also for these files, for up and downloading Office files, is that you get your colleagues on board, the expertise, and uh, you have a team um, with the colleagues that you have around you, and they can very on a very f flat learning curve, they can start all over. And this is my experience that uh, showing this one also to, sh to students um, drastically increases the acceptance of the tool. It makes them in a very slow manner familiar with working with GitLab because it's not just a universal content management system, as I said. It's also, uh, it can also be compared to Nextcloud or Dropbox or... Um, other file management systems where you up and download and replace files. And this is worth an episode. Um, I'm going to show this next time. And then hopefully you're going to join me because scenarios with more than me are much more interesting for collaboration. Uh, yeah. But so hopefully you're going to join me. Um, I will make you a member of the project. And uh, we can show everybody how we can work, for, for example, together um, on the same project with various scenarios, with, with uh, diver diverse uh, people in the team. Well, that's all for now. Um, I'm very happy that you joined. If you joined um, and uh, if you watch this episode later on, um, you can find this in, uh, on Twitch. In a, on a frequent basis, I have not, I have no clue right now when I, how often I can repeat this, but I'm very keen on doing the next episode. So uh, stay with me. I'm going to announce this on Twitter again, and I'm going to upload all the episodes on Vimeo, and I'm going to post this also on Twitter. So um, thanks for watching, and uh, good night. <laughs>